Chris, I'm going to hand over everything. Oh yeah. Okay. I'll do it. Uh, <laughs> thanks for having me. I mean, it's really cool to, it's cool to talk to y'all. I'm, I haven't been in Philly in a while. I mean, at least a year now. And um, I remember coming down like every year for the book fairs and I love it. I love Philly, but um, thanks for having me. Uh, my name is Chris Graves and I'm from Queens, New York, Long Island and Queens, a little bit of both. And um, yeah, so pretty much this is me as a, a human baby. And um, <laughs> so this is not my photograph, of course. This is a Gordon Parks photograph that I love to start with because it's just one of the first photographs I ever fell in love with when I was, uh, I went to Purchase College, which is a state university in New York, about 20 miles north of New York City. Um, I went to this state university because it was the cheapest option. I also applied to like SVA and um, Pratt and something else. I forgot where else. And my parents tell, told me in two, the year 2000, either you pay for your school at a private school or we will help you pay at the public school. And I chose the help. And um, I thank them for that because I came out of school with like no debt, which is like something I know that people are, you know, my wife struggles with, a lot of people struggle with all the time. So I really, I, I made a right call. Plus, I think it was the best, um, I think it was the best program for me. We, there was a lot of great photography teachers there. Um, a lot of great work coming out of that school still. And it was, it's a conservatory program. And I realized early on, well, my first semesters, I couldn't take photo classes because I had to do all these core classes instead. Um, and I wouldn't stand for that. So as soon as I got into school, I found a photojournalism class that was outside of the major and um, took that class and learned from, uh, you know, a dude named Sajuddin Shah, the only black photography professor I've ever had still to this time. And he was my first photography professor. And he taught me about like Gordon Parks's work. Um, this is a photograph named American Gothic. Um, he also taught me about Eugene Smith, W. Eugene Smith's work. Uh, so I was really loving this kind of photojournalism style work early on in my life when I was like 17 years old. Later in college, I started to get like super boring and love this, uh, uh, like George Tice, which is also Jersey, like Jersey, uh, Pennsylvania slash New York guy who was photographing the most boring landscapes on earth. And I love every bit of them. And I want, you know, I love them. So I got really involved, like loved his work, Thomas Street's work. And of course, like H Hiroshi Sugimoto's work, who is more uh, conceptual than the others. Like this is a theater series that, um, where he leaves the camera open, like an A10, I think A10 view camera open for the whole movie in these really grand theaters that most don't even exist anymore. So it was really kind of a mix between history and concept, which, which is pretty much what I'm doing now. Um, I think in 2003, it was the first time I went to MoMA ever. And I saw these big photographs by Andrei Skursky on the wall. And I didn't, the photographs were whatever, but the size was what got me. And I was like, damn, I didn't know a photograph could actually be that big. Um, and still that sharp, even though these things, when you look up close, they're like really terrible, but um, they look good from afar. And I was very interested in like uh, uh, these workers, uh, but back to college, I was just, you know, shooting, learning, uh, figuring out how to work in the studio, um, playing with friends in, in the studio. I mean, I did nothing but photography in college. I learned like nothing else pretty much. Um, at the same time, I realized that the money my parents were helping me with with college wasn't paying for like food for the most part. So I had to find a way to make some freelance money early on. So um, besides just working every moment when I wasn't at school, I also started to take on clients like, you know, uh, purchases a conservatory school. So there was like a dance conservatory, acting, um, music. So I worked for all of those people. I mean, I probably lost money working for all those people because I was on like shooting with film, practicing with like ISO 400 film and pushing it to 3,200 and hoping that something would come up on a negative. I mean, I know all like a lot of photographers have those days where like, I hope this comes out because I'm shooting in the dark and I'm just swiveling a tripod head in the dark. Pretty much. That's what I was doing. So, um, that's how I first started to make money in photography and it helped because hell, $20 was a lot then. Um, I also was, I lived with a theater major who was producing and directing and writing plays. And he um, had me do all of his poster work for that stuff. Um, I graduated from Purchase in 2004, moved back to Queens really soon after that and started to photograph the development 
of Long Island City and the Western Queens where uh, everything was changing. I mean, like gentrification was in. Actually, it probably wasn't gentrification as much as just some sort of displacement with uh, our, like construction or indust industrial zones. Um, because people, there was not many people living here. There was a few, but now it's just like glass towers everywhere. I've been here for a long time now, but this is all 2005 throughout um, now. And I was just walking around and biking around Queens, making photographs, um, trying to, I mean, for me at the point, I was just trying to make a good photograph or something that I at least liked. But when I look back, um, even when I look back, even a few years after making these photographs, I realized that I was photographing this history of Queens that was gone. I mean, all of these buildings are just these like really super duper boring glass towers now. And th there was at some point some interesting stuff happening in Queens and near and all cities. I mean, I don't know about Philly, but I know that Philly's changing in the same way now. Um, like it used to, uh, anyway, anyway. So I've been walking and biking around Queens for a long time and making photographs as I go, um, trying to capture things that are now, you know, gone. Even this parking lot is gone. I mean, they made that into a building so you can't even get this view anymore. Um, yeah, this is at Queensborough Plaza. This little clock, can you see the mouse pointer when I do this? Yeah, that's weird. So um, this little clock tower is like 15 stories high. First off, there's a building right here so you can't even see this view, but now there's this building that wraps around the clock tower that goes up like 80 stories. Kind of unbelievable how fast this neighborhood changed over. Um, Anyhow, but I keep shooting it. And you know, this is three blocks away. It still looks exactly the same. So pretty funny. Um, in 2007, I'm gonna talk mostly about my art career. I'm also a um, publisher. So I have been publishing books since about, my first books were in like 2010, but I truly started publishing other people's projects in 2015. We won't really go into that, but if you have any questions about that, ask them in the chat, or if there's a question section, I'll answer anything you have uh, to say, or if you have any questions. Um, in 2007, I started working at the Guggenheim Museum after an ex 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 girlfriend at the time told me that, um, "Hey, this job is available. You have a really crappy job at a at a little place in you know." I had a bad job. It paid me twelve dollars and fifty an hour, no medical. And she was like, "You should apply for this. It's double that, and it gives you medical." So I applied for the Guggenheim and got the job and worked there from 2007 till 2018, photographing the collection. Um, as well as uh, the artist that came through. This guy's name is Maurizio Catalan. He made that golden, he made that solid gold toilet. He also made the banana with the duct tape on the wall a few years ago. He loves bananas, as you can see. This is him with his uh, downward facing Pinocchio and, the, and a curator that most people would know. Um, that usually is face down in a, a puddle of water at the Guggenheim Museum. I was also responsible for photographing headshots and portraits for staff, uh, exhibitions uh, at the museum and off-site locations, um, art handling and preparation for pieces that were either going into the space or had never been built before. So like brand new pieces that were built. Like I, I forgot what dude made this, one of the, one of the cats from the 60s, 70s. Um, all sorts of event work that I did there as well. I'm just saying all this to say, like, I worked there for 11 years, which is pretty much at now it's a little bit less than a, a little bit more than a fourth of my life. And most of the other stuff you see is while I work there. So I was doing a lot of work freelance and uh, just on the side while I worked at the museum. It was like a base for me, pretty much. I photographed conservation issue work as well, like a lot of UV ultraviolet photography and super close details and x-rays and all that. Um, I got some pieces were in a uh, like subway ads, which is cool. I remember I had a, I put out like a, when Facebook was actually useful, I put out like a post that said like, hey, if you would, um, my subway's on the poster. If you see it, you should steal it off the subway. <laughs> and so many of my friends took it off the subway. I don't even know how they opened the thing, but I was like really glad. And they made me sign it with like huge Sharpies and I go to friends' houses and they still have it on their wall. It's pretty funny. Uh, and it was like the right side of this picture here. Like what this woman doing a split was like the poster. I should actually have that on my, I don't know why I don't have that up. Um, because I don't work here anymore. I don't care about this place. So that's why I don't have it up. But um, so I, sometimes, you know, this was a, an exhibition by a dude named Taigo Chang who um, did the Beijing Olympics open ceremony, but he also 
had these cars hanging from the ceiling of the Guggenheim. So I was there late nights, 2 a.m., photographing the installation process of these things. You can't see it, but there's people in these cars hanging and installing these lights as they're up there. I mean, they didn't, they put the cars up, then they put the lights on. Art handlers are amazing people. I mean, like art handlers do a lot of work that goes unnoticed at museums. Um, this is a guy's show that I don't like the guy, so I don't talk about him very much. Um, this show also was like ridiculous. It was a hundred thousand one dollar bills in an exhibition space, and found out later that this guy stole that idea and had to like was sued for this. Pretty funny. Anyhow, at the same time, around 2014, 15, I started to work on, I had been doing a lot of landscape work in Iceland and around the world. And I wanted to kind of focus back in on uh, black representation in America. So I started this project named Testament where um, for the most part, I photographed people with color changing LED light bulbs, kind of like you see behind me. I would surround, well, I'd still do this. So I surround people with these LED color changing LED light bulbs and I sit for them as a model and they choose on an app on the phone, um, their color combinations. So they choose their color combinations and we switch places and I photograph them with the colors they choose as a, and you know, they choose the poses of the final images that we use for, so it's totally um, a collaboration, these, these portraits, I mean, uh, for me, it was a total collaboration with these guys. And my practice, pretty much, I shoot, I photograph friends and family and friends of friends, but never strangers for this practice. So it's always people that I've known for a long time and have relationships with that I'm making work of here. This was, the, I photographed men for this project in 2014. Um, I don't know if people know who that is, but yeah, he's, he's cool. Um, and in 2015, I started to photograph women because my wife was like, why did you only photograph men? Women are not represented correctly, especially people of color. Um, and I was like, yeah, you're right. I'll photograph women. So I got like new lights, new bulbs. They're a little bit brighter. This is my sister, actually, one of my sisters. And uh, it worked out way better. I mean, like changing the backdrop from black or dark gray to white in itself made the everything pop more. So um it was a, I was just happy about it. I mean, I, you know, this, this work photographing, it took maybe a few weeks. I mean, I, I worked pretty fast. I photographed like every day for like three or four weeks to get enough and started to show them around, but same process for the, with women, a lot of the people brought other friends with them. So they would pose for each other in place to like, see what colors look like on each other. A lot of people chose, um, well, people chose their favorite colors or great combinations as well as, um, as well as like national flag colors and you know anything they could think of. For the most part, we I photograph each person in like three different color combinations and we use one or two for the final photographs. And then, uh, and then I get to show the work, which is really gratifying. Um, this is a show from the University of Arizona Tucson campus at a gallery named Joseph Gross. And I got the show because I pretty much was bored one night and emailed the director. I never had spoken to her before. She never heard of me. I emailed Brooke and said, like, I would love to show in your space. Here's one photograph that I've made and showed, like sent her a link to my website. She said, I really love your work. We are full, but I'll think about it because I really love the work. And I think two weeks went by, I sent her a book and she said, we should have your show. We're going to have it. And, but we have no money. So I was like, okay, well, how do I do a show for super cheap? Cause I mean, I have no money. And, um, so I print, you know, one, these prints on the left side are like uh, on Epson, I call it Epson enchanted matte paper, but it's enhanced matte paper, pretty inexpensive. It has a good D max or good dynamic range and doesn't glare off light. All like almost all other papers, if you put them high up on a wall, you'll get glare and I hated that. So this kind of eats light, these, uh, this paper. So it was great for a grid like this. Plus it's a light paper, you can just tape it. So pretty much when I have these shows, I make the 80 prints, I have the gallery tape them into a grid with blue tape. And then at the end of the show, they rip up the prints and they show me, they send me a picture of the ripped prints on the floor before they throw them in the garbage. So that's pretty much how I show these works around. Super, super duper wasteful. But anyhow, um, <laughs> so that's how I get to show for inexpensive. Uh, but I really, I went out there to kind of make photographs in this big space, true exhibition, uh, 
installation photographs of the of the work so that I had something for my future pretty much. So it was really good opportunity for me to go out there and do it. I also was able to show this video work that exists on my website. So you can check this out now. Um, that led a few years later into me working with Huffington Post on a very specific uh, Black Lives, oh, I'm sorry, uh, Black History Month campaign uh, named We Built This, where I was able to photograph uh, some celebrities that also run um, like nonprofit organizations or are doing about like funding for, you know, causes. So it was cool to like do this. This was also a really fast job. I think every time I photographed somebody, it was like 15 minutes with them in a studio and I had them choosing light colors. So their assistants or I would sit for them as they chose lights on me so that I could photograph them in their colors. So that was really cool. It was cool that they actually did that for me. I mean, I, cause they didn't know when they walked in what they were getting into. I wish somebody told them, but maybe somebody did and they just, anyway, it doesn't matter. But um, I don't know if everybody knows who this is. This is Shangela super cool super cool person uh yeah so was able to make um that kind of personal work into a gig which was awesome because i didn't think that i'd ever get a gig photographing people in these crazy ass colors if you have any questions please let me know i mean i guess you can't interrupt me but you you could you could um <laughs> kid fury and yeah, so this work was in 2018, really fast in a February, uh, January. I mean, I kind of rushed to do this in like two weeks so that I could release it in a February. Right after, well, this time is weird for me. It's not a structure, it is totally a circle. So this stuff is just happening. All this stuff just happens. It's not like time, it's not a chronology. Uh, I worked on a project named Oblique Reality in 2016 where I went around the country photographing eight locations where black men were killed by police officers. Um, and you can see where the locations are here and the, the people's names. And what I wanted to do with these photographs is make my super boring German slash George Tice uh, landscapes of places that we know. We know these places. These are not um, like hood places. These are just the suburbs. These are this is America, and I just wanted to show that these um, locations are where people are getting murdered by police officers. These are not specialized places. These are places that we visit every day. So I wanted to bring it back home in a way. Um, so I made those eight, and I eventually worked with uh, Huff, uh, who? Uh, Vanity Fair um, to release them online through one of their blogs. Uh, so I was really I'm thankful for them to like even consider the work. Um, yeah, so that's what it looked like on Huffington, Huffington Post some years back. Currently, however, I'm working on a like a kind of two book series. Uh, the, the series is called uh, Truth. How's my time, by the way? When do we start and how much time do I have to do this? I have no idea how long I've been talking. You're uh, doing great. No, it's, you're doing great. Um, okay, so let's say that you have another 20 minutes. Okay. No room for questions. Yeah, that sounds great. Uh, so this series is named, uh, well, the series of two books, two slash three books is called Truth and Ruin. I'm trying to release this later this year. I have, for the most part, released all of my books under my own company, uh, but this time I'm actually looking for a publisher and may have one, so that would be really cool. Um, they'll come in like a slip case, a nice, beautiful, I am going to do something so cool with the slip case that I can't tell you guys about, but it's going to be like, yeah, it's gonna be something. It's gonna be different. I I only have one book that looks like, like the slipcase looks like this and I'm very excited by it. Um, and it relays back to those first works from other artists that I showed you, but I'm working on this project. The first book is called Privileged Mediocrity and it takes us on a American journey through racism in the landscape, people stuck within this concept, as well as uh, infrastructure problems, climate change issues, um, what else is going on here? Some weirdness, just weirdness. <laughs> um, a lot about uh, redlining, dish, redlined neighborhoods. Like this is in St. Louis. Uh, these are two photographs from St. Uh, East St. Louis. Sorry, that's been heavily redlined, um, and uh, gentrification happening all over the place. But we're kind of focused. I focus more on New York since I know it. You can again see that clock tower. I, I can't wait until that building's done behind it because it's like this tall. It's unbelievable, unbelievably terrible. Uh, this is uh, on the border of the Carolinas in a place named South of the Border. And it's this 
kind of Mexican themed bullshit park. I don't know if I can curse, but I'm, I'm probably just going to do that anyway. It doesn't matter. Um, uh, yeah, this was in uh, Ithaca, which is a strange, strange place. And I'm also getting, well, more interested in photographing on the West Coast. This happened, this was, uh, this is in Northern California during the Tubbs fire in 2017. This is like one day before I got married down the block from this. Luckily it rained that night, so we didn't have to cancel our wedding, but like, uh, yeah. So this is one piece and this is right after our wedding the next day. So I'm going back, back out there to make some more photographs uh, of, what's happening to the people of color and neighborhoods that like live right here that had houses burned down and did they rebuild? What, what is that process like? So I'm going out to make those photographs in a few weeks. Um, so this is one piece of that project. The next book, we kind of swerve into this work that I've been doing for last year. Um, I got hired for three jobs, three or four jobs with National Geographic photographing the monuments in the South or the Confederate monuments specifically in the Southern states. And also these other weird kind of Confederate dumb things like this is the arm of Stonewall Jackson. Like they, he, his story's crazy but they pretty much cut his arm off to amputate it. He still died, but they put his body somewhere else that you'll see later and separated his arm and put this at a different gravesite which is completely ridiculous. Um, mostly things are kind of ridiculous, but I was there, I was down in Richmond, Virginia for seven days straight off in June when they were having a lot of protests. And uh, these, like some of these statues were being torn to the ground by the public. And then eventually the city came in and took a bunch of the other ones down as well. But I was there for a really special time. I mean, it was really, I did not know what I was getting into. I thought I was just going to be making landscapes and it turned out that I was making a little bit more than just landscape photographs of these spaces. I actually, you'll see the before and after. I went there in June and then I went back in August on a 24 day road trip with National Geographic to photograph all of the American South. I'll, sh I'll show you, I'm going to maybe have enough time to show you this PDF of a piece of this second book. This book is called Latency. And to me, that means catching up with time. This stuff probably should never existed in the first place, I feel. But um, what I try to do is step back from that part of it, like my personal feelings, and just give you what the scenes look like without me being involved in the scenes, I guess. But, you know, that's kind of, that can't really happen. We all have our, you know, we all come from a certain um, perspective. But yeah, I've had fun making this work with them. I was really blessed to have got, I mean, it was my first job with National Geographic, so that was really cool. And they trusted me to just make the work. They gave me the days and I went down and just produced the work and I didn't have anybody questioning me or anything. So it was really, that's the kind of job I like the most. I mean, a job where you just like, here you have five days, go do it and, you know, send us pictures after, but you know, sometimes it doesn't work that way. Sadly, it doesn't work that way often. I'm realizing that now. Oh yeah, this one's fun. I, this, I, I was at an Arthur Ashe Memorial photographing just the Arthur Ashe Memorial and this guy, like drives, this is in a circle in the middle of a decently busy intersection. He drives up to the circle, parks his car in the middle of the street, leaves his doors open, writes this on. <laughs> I got like every piece of him writing this on. There was more people out there. I didn't feel like in danger at all. This guy was just doing what he wanted to do. Got back in his car, drove away. Five minutes later, two women come and scrub that off and scrub all of this stuff off actually. And he comes back and starts to mess with them again. Very strange moment in Richmond, Virginia, but I became a journalist that day for some reason or for whatever. Um, then we went on, I, me and my friend Marshall went on this longer 24 day road trip through the American South, photographing monuments that we found along the way. The schools dedicated to like slave, like slave owners and Confederates, which is really crazy to see. Like, I mean, this one was random. I had this, I made this huge map of Confederate monuments, which I got to photograph maybe 250 or 300 of them, which is a lot, but there's like 3000 of them. So like, I didn't even kind of, I kind of only scratched the surface with this work. Um, also Charleston, super racist, Charleston, South Carolina, at least the landscape of Charleston has all this racial tension involved. Like this, this building in the middle is an old slave market where they used to auction off slaves for, I think decades or hundreds of years, actually. Um, this is called Stone Mountain. This exists north like east of atlanta 20 minutes east of atlanta not even 20 minutes and this is the riders of the confederacy riding off into the distance it was designed by the man who made or designed or made 
partly by the dude who made Mount Rushmore and it is much bigger than Mount Rushmore, which is um, so sad. Uh, <laughs> more schools and more Confederate monuments. So this book is called Latency. And then there's a piece of this book that I'll actually show you now if I have time. Uh, this is the picture that they used for, this is behind me on the wall and also a picture that was on the cover of National Geographic for the January issue and the full 24 page spread, which is cool because I did 24 days of traveling and they gave me a 24 page spread in the February issue of National Geographic for the work. So I really appreciated that. And um, it's a good story. It's a good story about like racism in, the, in our wonderful country. Um, so do I have enough time to like quickly show you what I'm working on in the middle? There's a middle section of that second book and it's called Southern, I call it Southern Horrors and it's based on a Southern horror by Ida, Ida B. Wells. And yes, if I have enough please. time, you can show that. Okay. You're totally good. So this part I'm actually interested in like a lot because this is the travel. This is the, um, it starts, I'm gonna make this all black pages so that when you look at the book from the side, you can see like this black strip of 32 pages. And um, John Edwin Mason, a professor at UVA is gonna do my like a 2,500 word essay about this cause that's his career. And I pretty much, um, we're figuring out um, how to make this book happen, right? Like this piece of this book happen. Um, uh, so we're going to go by parts and those parts will be by state kind of, if you see like really here, it says site of auction block. I actually didn't even know that I took this picture until after like a month later I saw, oh, does that read something? And then I noticed that I missed out on a different photograph that I should have taken. Um, but yeah, so this is kind of the, the, this is the chronology of the work that I made on that long road trip and all the Confederate monuments, schools, and locations that I saw along the way. So we're, yeah, we're figuring it out now. That's Virginia, this is Carolinas. Everyone should read that because I'll give you a minute to just sit, let that sink in. So the first sentence. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's bad news, man. This was uh, right across from Augusta, Georgia. And yeah. Okay, so yeah, so this is all in South Carolina. Is that right? Yeah, South Carolina. There's a lot. There's a lot of stuff here, but I didn't. I didn't want to put all these in like a big book with big pictures because because I'm like, I'm not going to be representing the, the like Confederacy in any sort of like positivity. So I wanted to make them like, more informational than uh, beautiful photographs. Even though sometimes I have these weird ones that I really love that most people will not even understand if they just saw the photograph. They're like, this is one of my favorite pictures. Nobody else likes it, but I love it. So I'm making it big in my book. And it's pretty much a bunch of cannonballs from the Civil War, pretty, or like the recreation of cannonballs from the Civil War. <laughs> the South is crazy. My dad's from Montgomery, Alabama, and a lot of my family's in Atlanta, but you know, the South is still crazy. Um, yeah, but even if it's a beautiful photograph, I think that it, it shows the power and the the locations. The like these the things. Look, exist, I mean, there's something everywhere. really powerful about it. I mean, even if it's a beautiful photograph, it it enables us to um, feel something and the grab. Well, I hope so. Of that, you know. <laughs> yeah, I hope I so. I um. It was a lot of work. I mean, you know, a lot of these, like this location, my my buddy, the person who's driving me around a lot, Marshall Shuttle, who's an excellent photographer in his own right, he kept me on my toes because he makes great pictures like in a snap and I have to think, but he's really just authentically amazing. We're making a book with him right now, actually. A plug and, um, but sometimes he'd just stay in the car. Like he'd be like, I'm going to stay in the car. It's running. If anything happens, run back to the car and we'll keep moving. That happened in multiple locations. That location in, in particular, I remember he was like, yeah, people are staring at me and he's like a white dude and people are staring at him. So they're definitely staring at me. So I was like in and out of some of these locations. Um, there was one set, I mean, this is, a lot of this is near Augusta and Augusta, Georgia is about two hours east of Atlanta. And sorry if you've heard this before, because I definitely tell this story now more than before. But I, you know what? I don't actually talk about this work much. But from Augusta to Atlanta, it's a two hour drive. And I mapped out that we could hit 16 different locations with Confederate monuments along that road. Actually, it turned into being like 18 or 20 because we found random ones along the side of the roads. And also, um, we didn't get to all of them. 
So within that two hour drive, we spent about 11 hours in a car up and down the highway, making like as many photographs as we could. George has some racism problems. Um, and Al in Alabama, where my family's from, Montgomery is where my dad's from. And I've been there before and wanted to go back and make these photographs. And Montgomery, Alabama in particular has a ton of schools devoted to slaves, like Sydney Lanier High School, which is here, beautiful building. Jefferson Davis High School, um, Prattville Dragoon. Uh, this is outside of a, a elementary school, these two monuments here. This is the Confederate White House. Uh, one of the first, this is the first Confederate White House because I also photographed the next Confederate White House in Richmond. But this first one is directly across the street from the state capitol, which, you know, all of these other racist monuments exist at. I mean, it's really, it's just unbelievable. The country is unbelievable. Can Anyhow, I ask a question? Yeah, of course. I have a question. So did you? Um, oh, I'm sorry. Wait, I'm done. So wait, ask me that question one second. I end this part of the book with John Brown's fort in Harper's Ferry who, you know, he fought against this kind of civil war shit. And um, I wanted to end this piece of that book there. So that's how we're doing that. And okay, cool. Now we can talk. Go ahead, Sarah. That's my question is, is the structure of the book by state? That piece of the book is by state or by three states at a time, yeah. Mm -hmm. And have you explored the states outside of the Confederacy because states that were in the confederacy because there's obviously there's more yeah um right no no more it's pretty I'm done now. overwhelming uh, yeah i did eight out of the you know there's 13 confederate states but there's also like texas that has a bunch of them also i photographed um in austin before that trip actually and i saw a few confederate monuments in on their state capitol grounds but but yeah um no i'm not going i'm not doing anymore i'm done with that i can't shoot that stuff anymore i bet <laughs> I bet. Um, I do, uh, there are a couple questions, Daniel. Just wait. Wait a second. Um, Crystal asks, "How much? How much research time goes into your trips prior to heading out and making the photographs?" Well, that trip in particular was a lot of research because I had to warrant them giving me twenty-four days of money. So I had to show them that I would be actually making work for twenty-four days, right? So that was like, you have to show that you'll be in different places. So I made them a map. You know what? I think I should show you the map and then you will understand how much research I did for that. Most of the time I do way less research, but these days I have to do just a little bit more to, for jobs. When it's, when it's on my own, I don't do much research at all. I just make the photographs, walk outside and like make work happen. But, um, okay, here we go. This one's fun. Oh my God, look at this shit. I haven't looked at this in a while, but, um, can you see that map? Oh, yeah. cool. So, the blue dots and the stars are Confederate monuments and schools. The red are just mine, but and all this stuff is mine. But all the blue is where we went on a on a road trip from D.C. down here, went here, looped back, came across Georgia to Atlanta, or Montgomery, up, up, up through Chattanooga, out to the. Oh, we actually didn't do these because these were in like Memphis, mm -hmm. and we just didn't have enough time to get to these ones up here. But we did like all of that. So that was, that was that road trip. It probably took me a good, it took me a long time. I don't know how much time it took me to put that map together, but um, it took some time. <laughs> uh, it's definitely time that you don't get paid for when you do that stuff. But you know, at the end of the day, sometimes you get lucky and you get a cover of like a magazine that is, you know, I never thought that I'd be on the cover of National Geographic. That's good. Daniel, what's your question? Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm really interested in the last works you were showing and all the monuments. Are you familiar with the concept of the lost cause? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what that's all about. I mean, really, uh, since the end of Reconstruction, the South rewrote the narrative of, the, of why they were at war and why they lost and what they were fighting for. Oh, and, yeah. Uh, I mean, for the, the, the difficulty with what you're doing is really... It, was, it really became embedded in America for all those years, uh, mm -hmm. up until civil rights in, in, uh, in 1964. And how that, I mean, even that, when I was a kid, I thought Robert E. Lee was this great guy, but he was, he was an idiot, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, he was a racist as were so many other people, they owned slaves. Uh, but they were able to really provide all these monuments to these, traitors I, I mean are you totally. is that like are you bringing that whole idea besides the fact that of white supremacy 
and, and the black experience you're bringing that into your into your work I think that just is, you know, like I, I'm not, tr I, it's not something that I was trying to bring into the work, but the writing will help to bridge that gap. Like, I'm not going to actually talk about the United Daughters of the Confederacy in the photographs. I'll show you a picture of it. And then you'll have some writing to kind of do your own research to figure out like, what does it mean when you have a United Daughters of the Confederacy? Or what I showed you that, um, that John Brown monument right in the left, there's in the bottom left of that photograph is another monument in Harpers Ferry that is devoted to it was made by the United Daughters of the Confederacy, but it talks about the one black slave that was killed by John Brown by accident early on. And it's just this, it's the same thing. It's like the, it's the motive. It's the, um, it's that lost cause mentality. Well, and, yeah, um, I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, everybody that looks, if I were, if I were a person of color, I would have probably blown them up a long time ago. But... <laughs> well, that, you know, that does never end well for people of color. So <laughs> <laughs> I would have been dead. I know that. Yeah. I mean, I think about that stuff all the time. Like, why can't we just like explode Stone Mountain? I mean, like, that would be a beautiful day. But yeah, like, we should do that. One it's just shot. Like, it's just not. <laughs> I, I, it's just not going to happen. Well, I mean, thank you. I love that work. And if uh, I'm going to look for it because it fits right into, uh, you know, I've done a lot of reading about this. So it fits <laughs> right for me. So thank you. Yeah. So the, the writing will be like, I can't wait for that essay to come in because it's just going to put it, it's just going to be, it's just going to be excellent. I can't wait for that. I mean, the photographs have been made and I'm glad that, you know, I couldn't have done it without getting paid to do it because I would have never gone to like Tennessee or Kentucky or West Virginia on purpose. So um, it was good to have, it was good to have be forced to do something so crazy. Uh, <laughs> and now I get to like make a book of it, which is cool. Um, Maria has a question. Maria, do you want to unmute yourself? Um, hi, how are you? Hello. So nice to see your presentation. Um, so I have a question. It's, um, it's two parts. One is, how did you get from being an aspiring photographer to actually doing it full time for a living? And then my second part is, what is your best advice for somebody who's trying to become an artist or someone who's like, who just Wait, loves art? Can you just it? ask me one question at a time and just... Because two, I'll just get lost and I'll answer okay, both okay. at once and it will be a bad answer. But uh, the first question, the, both the first question, uh, how did I be like, well, gradually, I would say, I mean, I just kept working. I think that there was no uh, moment where, oh, I'm now, I mean, look, I don't have a job. Like I have no jobs in the future. I'm a freelance photographer and I have no future jobs. So this is my life. Um, so I don't know if there's a it's just sometimes you get lucky with a good job. You know, like most of the time I'm photographing, well, all of my jobs are good jobs because they pay me money. But um, for the for my day jobs, I'm still photographing artwork freelance after leaving the Guggenheim. So that's my main gigs. I get to go into like Pace Gallery or David's Werner Gallery, these big places and uh, photograph the collection. So, you know, that helps me out. Uh, but I wouldn't say that I have, you know, I've been very fortunate. I keep, I keep it moving. I'll say like, Get your work out there, tell people it exists and keep making it. Like don't show people the worst work you've ever made. I think that's always not helpful, but um, you know, at least if it's decent, Instagram is a place for it. And if it's really good, never put it on Instagram or at least like limit how, limit the goodness you put on Instagram. Cause that's just like, they'll just, why, why, why give up your best work? But um, I would say just keep it moving. Keep showing people work. Keep trying to get some opportunities. If you want to do portraiture, keep photographing people you know until people start paying you for it. If you want to do landscapes, good luck. No one pays for landscapes unless you're super lucky. I mean, like I can't even imagine getting another job shooting landscapes. It was it was like once in a lifetime kind of, but um, I don't know. Landscape stuff's hard. But like if you're making portraiture, still eh, maybe still life, still life, you can make a lot of money. You can shoot like my whole life. I didn't want to work for other people, kind of, and I always have so. I don't think that's ever going to change, but doing that freelance has been a little bit easier than having like a full-time job doing that where I'm sitting in an office, like why, am, why is this my life kind of? Um, so I don't know. What's your second question? Um, you sort of and are you sitting in a racing chair? Like is your chair come, does it come out of a car? Like, is it, <laughs> it's, um, it's a gaming chair. Yeah. It's nice. so comfortable. I recommend it. Yeah, I've seen it. It looks comfortable. It looks like plush. It's the best chair. It's like, I mean, if you're going to be sitting in a desk and I, if you're going to be a photographer editing some pictures, yeah, I yeah. recommend it a million percent. Gaming chairs are the way to go. Oh, the game, that looks really good. I have the sale, this like this Herman Miller thing here. And that's, oh, that helps me out too. It's really, it's quite nice. Um, no, it's, 
Yeah. But the second best. question. Um, so you sort of answered it a little bit with, um, you know, uh, tell me some of your best advice. Um, but I guess, I guess just to elaborate a little bit more, um, um, what sort of has, what sort of like inspires you to sort of continue this path? Um, and what's your best advice to sort of stay with that motivation? Because you've seen someone so motivated and inspired through everything. Oh, uh, well, I'm just not good at anything else. So I have to do this to survive. That's pretty much what I'd say. Like, I have no other skills, so I have to do this. That's it. I don't know. How, that's the, that's my answer. Like, a, that's your like, purpose. Okay, so Chris, I, I was going to start off saying the people with the shortest bios have have the are the busiest, most to, most prolific, and most talented. And so I was just like, Chris, you do a lot of things. You're funny. <laughs> well, I make books, but they're all photo books, and I just make books with fo- photographers that are better than me. So it's very easy. And um, I have a designer now that does all the hard work, so I don't have to do shit on that end. So I do make photographs. That's it. I am with the work that I make for clients. It's very, I chose a career where I don't have to photograph moving things, right? I photograph paintings, sculptures, Mm -hmm. uh, still life and at science, that's science. So like, it's for me, it's super simple for me to go with like two lights, I mean, I'm photographing books on my floor in the living room right now. Like there's a, you know, you can see like, there's like my, my, like this shebang a bang. They got like, we got the, um, like all my stuff is just here ready for after this to like photograph some books on the floor for a client. So, you know, I keep it like 2d on like, and not moving. And then, you know, you can do your, you can make the money when it comes, you know, you don't have to be somewhere specific and, you know, I don't want to photograph models and stuff like that. It's like way too much. Like, that's too much. Mm. I, have, I don't have the mentality to like be, you know, up at 6 a.m. dealing with bullshit. Um, um, David has a David has a question for you. Um, are you currently represented by a gallery and what percentage of your work would you consider fine art? Fine art is not a thing that's like we're I'm an artist and I just make the work and I'm, I don't consider myself a certain part of that. It's just I make art. So I think that we do have to get rid of that fine art word actually. It doesn't really do anything for us. It doesn't help us. So like fine art, documentary, or like, you know, that stuff, conceptual, like none of that matters. Like we're artists and people should just look at us as artists, not specific zones. It's like calling like, it's it's pretty much like calling a rapper a rapper. They're a musician. You know, like it's not like you're being real specific with what you're talking. Anyway, that may sound stupid. So I'm just gonna stop there. But what was your second question? No, there was none. Terrell, oh, no, no. there was no. a. Terrell has. Do you mind if I step in for a minute? Um, Terrell is has his hands up, and he's a Philadelphia-based artist. Um, so I don't know what you're gonna say or ask Terrell, but he's making amazing work. So I just wanted to. Do you want to? Oh yeah, in? thank you. Yeah, thank you, sir. I appreciate that. Um, Chris, I have two questions for you. I'll ask them one at a time. Um, Please. The first question is, um, what pushed you, you kind of touched on it, but what pushed you to start to get into publishing? Um, being a Philadelphia-based artist, a lot of the artists that I've met and I've talked to and that I you know, really look at and admire their work have been published by you. Really? Uh, that's so funny. I just wanted to, yeah, nice. wanted to know, cool. yeah, what kind of I'll pushed you that. Into, into that? Uh, well, I ran a gallery in Dumbo, Brooklyn for three years uh, under the same name, Chris Gray's Projects. And I realized that I hated the idea of selling rich people $5,000 prints and never getting my friends to be able to afford anything. So that was like not going to work for me long term. And the only way I saw to get art into people's homes was to do it with books. Mm. So that's why I switched to publishing because I could sell someone. How I still think about it is if you want one of my books, you can stop drinking for three days and you can buy a book. Right. You'll never be able to, you'll never be able to buy a $4,000 print from me. I know that. And the worth is not there. I mean, like what, why do you want a $4,000? print? I mean, I wouldn't buy a $4,000 print from me. I mean, luckily people do buy $4,000 prints from me sometimes <laughs> very rarely, but like I can't afford my own work. So it's like, I can afford my own books though. And that's where, I, that's why I started making books. That's like the simple answer. Nice. Yeah. Kind of like the uh, accessibility versus like the. For sure. To, for me art. to sell something for $28 to someone and have them love it is way, is way more like, 
like it, it fills my heart to get you a $20 product. I don't care about like the money in a five. I, I don't care. I'm not doing it for money. So it's not really a, it's not about that. Yeah. Thank you. And uh, the other question I had was actually off of something you said earlier um, about limit the goodness that you put on Instagram. I know a lot of different people have different, uh, you know, perspectives on it. But um, and that's something I battle with myself as well. Like, do I put this out there to possibly, you know, to show what I'm working on, to possibly get it to somebody's eyes? Or do I mm-hmm. keep it to make it more special for if it is, you know, shown in a show? Yeah. Um, so I just wanted to know what is your your perspective or kind of where would you recommend pushing it rather than. We don't have many outlets as photographers, actually. So I think if you want pushing your stuff on Instagram is a good idea because that's the, probably the only place people are going to see the work. I shouldn't have actually talked crap about Instagram because Instagram is where we show people the work for the most part. No one's looking at Facebook. No one's looking at my, you know, the website gets limited visits in comparison to the amount of people that look at Instagram on a daily basis. So we are finding most of our people on Instagram. Um, but it's tricky because it's, I don't know if I want to keep giving Zuckerberg my, my, like my money, my, like my, uh, my, like uh, my, what is it? Like my intellectual property, you know, like it's like at some point, at some point something has to change right now. People are still stuck in this world of like three apps on your phone and then that's it. But like, hopefully we can break away from that. And, you know, I'm, and I, and this is like controversial, but I'm totally into NFTs now. I think that this is a way like, and maybe most people don't know what that is right now, but people will know very soon because it is growing, but like yeah. non-fungible tokens and being able to sell images on the blockchain in a way is intriguing, very intriguing to me because you can have your own collections somewhere and people can own them in a way and people can support you without supporting someone else. Like how many prints can you sell on Instagram? I mean, wh- how likely is that? Right. Uh, so for me, it's like, I might as well sell a print through the blockchain. They, they buy the digital image and I give them a print. Like that sounds better to me than, than Instagram. So like, you know, so just be careful. I can't tell you how to make it work, but you know, if you make a dope image, you should probably show people. So Instagram would be the place to do that for sure. But right. also, you know, have a mailing list, have, um, send people images individually. If you've ever sold anything to somebody, keep sending them the new work. I don't ever do that because I'm lazy, but I would like build your collector base. If you have any, any collectors, even if they're $20 collectors, you build that base because they will maybe support you in the future when you want $40. And then when you want $80 and when you want $140, you know, like, so it moves up people. Some people become rich. Like I have friends that were buying my $30 books that eventually bought $3,000 prints that happens, you know? So they didn't have that money when we were 20. Right. Like, you know, it takes years for these rich ass motherfuckers to become millionaires. <laughs> uh, but, you know, it takes time sometimes. But, you know, use, just be smart about it. And, you know, if you're smart about it, nothing, what can, what could, what bad could happen, really? I mean, people are going to steal your images no matter what, that you can't, you can't not have that happen to you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. Delphine, Delphine's in the house. Hey. Hello. Hi. I can't hear anything you're saying. You're you did. Um, here we go. Okay. First of all, <laughs> I want to commend you on your publishing. I think it's just absolutely awesome. And thank you. It's great. I have um, Nydia Blast. I'm on pre ordered and I can't wait oh, to get yeah, that. Oh, yeah. Nydia. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Amazing. Um, That's selling fast. That's really Yeah. I, I made sure I got my pre order in. <laughs> Nice. But um, I'm, I wanted, I'm glad you brought up NFTs because that was really the question. I saw that you have a whole collection on OpenSea and I wanted mm-hmm. to know, um, h- how do you think NFTs will impact the future of photography? Like if you could just expand, I know you just touched on it, but. Yeah, I, I don't know how they will do it. I mean, it, it, it could fall apart in two years. It could, be a, it could be that we're living in a huge bubble, but it could also be that um, this is a place where we should be put, put all of our work so that we have some sort of saleability of it. I mean, uh, you know, I think they announced yesterday that the USD or the US dollar is gonna go digital. Like that is something that's happening within the year or two. So that means blockchain means something. That means it's real. You know, like to me, that means that there's a future of it. So let's be early on that. You know, like, especially people of color have not been early on these things in the past. So it's really important to like hedge your bets. So for me, it's like, cool, if I can, 
put some stuff up here, try to meet some collectors in this new space, that can mean something. Like for me, I was lucky. I um, started with NFTs like three weeks ago, four weeks ago, not even that long ago, not even a month ago. And I had a dude named Justin Aversano kind of hook me up with um, like teaching me how to get on it a little bit. And it was just like basic knowledge, but we had a good conversation and I got on. Um, he bought one of mine, I bought one of his, and then he introduced me to his collector base. And the next day I sold $11,000 worth of photographs as digital images, right? Now I have $11,000. I mean, I wouldn't have that with print sales. No one's buying my prints like that. So, you know, this is, there's economic or there's environmental problems here with the NFTs mm -hmm. for sure. And, but, and, and, but, and these will hopefully change very soon with like proof of state, like we can get super nerdy, but I'm going to try to keep it not nerdy. Things will change and they will change for the better with this. I'm pretty sure very soon. Two, I'm a freelance photographer with no, future jobs and I need all the money I can get. So if I can hustle my way into 20 grand in three weeks, then I'm gonna take it. I hear you. Okay, thank you. I was just really excited to see you in that space too. And okay. that's the money part of this. The non-money part is the legacy. on OpenSea, you can put like for like a hundred dollars of gas fees, you can put everything you've ever made on there and you can make it all free if you want. You can do whatever you want. You don't have to be there for the money. You can make things $10 or a hundred dollars or $5, you know, but eventually it's like, wow, one day I'm going to be able to find a photographer in Madagascar that makes great work that I can make a book with or in Australia or Antarctica, you know, like the world can open up here in a way that the photography world has been really stifling, really stifling. Um, exactly. yeah, so I think, I think there's some, I think there's a future for it for sure. Absolutely. And then <laughs> imagine when the first museum puts all of their digital assets on the blockchain. Mm -hmm. And when you can, like, I, I just mentioned this earlier today and I was like, okay, I can either steal a crappy image of Guernica, like Picasso's Guernica from the web, or if the Reina Sofia gave it to me for a dollar for the high res, I can just have it for a dollar. And how many people are going to buy Guernica for a dollar? How many people are going to buy like the Picasso's total black and white series for a dollar on each file so that they can put it on their huge flat screen at home, like their 65 inch, $400, 65 inch flat screen at home so they can see some real art in their house. I mean, these are things that I'm thinking about as the future. Like people are not buying prints like they used to. The people that are young don't give a crap about your print or your book. So like, can I see that on my phone? Can I zoom in and see the details of that on my tablet? You know, like this is our future. Unfortunately, maybe, but this is definitely happening. Thank you. Um, Daryl Ann. Hey, uh, hi. Hi, Chris. How are you? What's up? You're always here. I love it. <laughs> this is just a silly question. I just wanted you to elaborate on the rifle that's on the wall behind you. Oh, yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a murderer. Uh, no. Um, this rifle is crocheted, made by a friend named Nathan Vincent, who is, who is awesome at crocheting guns. I mean, he did this a long time ago. This is probably like a decade, more, more than a decade ago. But he crochets like these really um, interesting pieces. Like he's done a locker room filled with dynamite. He's done four foot army men on walls and on the floor. And like he's made locker, uh, he's made... Um, he made what I say, and which I pr was probably definitely not the right way to put this is like he crochets man things, lawnmowers, guns, uh, deer heads. He has a lion head crocheted. He has this beautiful T Rex, which I really want, but I cannot afford. But you Nathan, know, if you ever see this, I need that T Rex, but I can't afford it. From this distance, it looks really realistic. I would never have thought it was crocheted. That's like, well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, I know. That's probably going to get me in a lot of trouble at some point. I live in like a rent stabilized building here in Queens and uh, you I'm on the second floor. So people can definitely see that gun from the windows. And I'm sure that I'll have some complaints very soon. Oh, all right. Well, we can see it. <laughs> so, thank you. <laughs> all I need is like a Black Lives Matter sign, like right next to it. And then people will think. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah. Make it political. There you go. <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> Thanks. Mm hmm. This is great. Oh, Nanette, you wanted to know the name of the artist again? Um, oh, I'll write it down. Thanks. I don't know. I, his website's probably just his name, but Nathan Vincent with an A because, oh, you know what? That's a private. Okay, let's see. I can do it right this time. 
So while he's typing, um, I just wanted to let you know that Nadia Bloss is next week. So Nadia. Nadia's going to be giving a Thursday night photo Nidia. talk. Lydia. Nidia. Nidia. Sorry, Nidia. Nidia Bloss. I've never met her. So Nidia, forgive me. Nidia is going to be here next week. Yeah. Um, and I also wanted to let people know that John Edwin Mason gave a Thursday night, a phenomenal Thursday night photo talk a while back. Um, and it's in our YouTube archive. Um, and I, cool. I highly recommend you watching that. It'll be a, well worth 90 mi minutes. And he just yeah, he's was the best. Fire. He's so smart. Yeah. It always work with, I mean, the other thing is always work with people that are better than you. I mean, that's, that's a staple. You have to work with people that are smarter than you. Um, <laughs> If there's any more questions, ask them. I'm here. How do you work with people smarter than you without feeling insecure? Know that you're not as smart as them and then you won't feel secure. Just, just wondering. Okay. Yeah, no, I have no insecurities about smartness. I know that I don't know shit. So like I- Yeah, I no, that's not true. I, I'm sorry, <laughs> that's specific. Chris, you know a lot, but we don't all know everything. And Yeah, that's uh, true. I mean, I know a very specific- each other. I have a very specific and narrow lane that I follow and it's been helpful for me, but there's a, like the world is pretty much a million times more than that lane that I fit into. Yeah. I know from my experience that understanding, knowing what I don't know and yeah. finding collaborators, um, mm -hmm. it's just really generative. Yeah. John Edward Mason is going to write 2,500 of the best words that I'm ever going to see in my life, probably for my book. And I, I appreciate that he'll do that for me. <laughs> when are you anticipating for the book to be out? Or what are you hoping for regarding? I would hope that it's out for fall. I mean, I imagine that our, our country is just back now. I, I mean, COVID's still happening, but I don't think America gives a hell anymore. So we're back. So that means that photo fairs are going to be back in the fall for sure, I bet. So in September, I'd hope to have that book on some tables. Because uh, yeah. there's a lot of book fairs in the fall. Like I hope Chicago comes back in November, Boston in October, uh, Yale in December, maybe Paris Photo in November. Hopefully, if we're lucky, New York Photo, New York Art Book Fair in September. I'm probably going to run one in July here in New York with uh, at Foley mm -hmm. Gallery. So stay tuned. Um, as long as you know it's it feels safe enough. You know, I have my I've luckily gotten vo both of my vaccines already. So like I am definitely a poster child for get your vaccine. I got my vaccine at Shea Stadium. So I got my like, my little Met sticker here for all the New Yorkers here. Um, anyhow, so yeah, I think it's coming back. We're coming back in full force. So fall, hopefully, but I have a, I have a call with my publisher tomorrow to see if they actually want to publish all this racism. I have to go questions, Chris. Um, can I ask you, Eugenio, how do you decide the anything no, you were off mute. I just can't hear you. If you know sign language, yeah. that won't help me at all. No? Yep. You're oh, on I mute, have... but I still can't hear a word you're saying. Oh. Click on the little uh, arrow next to your microphone and change your select the microphone. Um... No. Oh, man. Write it. <laughs> Any other questions while no. Eugenio figures out? I, I can hear you. I can hear you, Eugene. Human I can language. hear you. So everybody, can can you hear me now? Yeah. I can hear you. I can't hear. Oh, do, I, oh, actually, maybe I can't hear anybody. Something happened on my end. My bad. <laughs> you can hear me, but I can't hear anybody, right? That's my fault. What the hell is going on with my computer? Who knows? Hello, hello, Chris. Can you hear? Hello? Oh, I guess. All right, give me a second. I've totally screwed myself here. Okay, so okay, now I can hear you. I apologize. Uh, thank you for the great talk. I have two questions. One is, how do you decide the dimensions and the number of copies that you sell? Of what? Of books or prints? Or prints? Prints? Um. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. Oh, actually, somebody I had somebody did have a question, and this leads to this. I am represented by two spaces. One is called Sasha Wolf Projects, and she doesn't have a gallery, but she runs. Uh, she represents people out of New York City, and I I work with Sean Theodore, who has actually with PPAC, isn't he, or connected to PPAC? Yes. Is he here? Is Sean here? I don't even know. But um, 
and he represents me on the what like kind of everywhere else like west coast and like with Paris photo la i say Paris. i should say paris photo paris sorry that's all wrong mm -hmm. paris texas la in la and that is an actual gallery space so we hope to have some shows as soon as like we get out of this quarantine or i guess we're not in quarantine when people can actually show up to shows really in a real way um but as far as the print sales i've always been um I sell work in about three sizes for each print, 16 by 20, 32 by 40 and larger, whatever that means, um, what, what, however large a print can go. Usually it can go pretty large because I'm using a medium format uh, digital for the last five or six years. Before that I was using like full frame digital and before that I was just using a four or five view camera. Um, and uh, yeah, so they go pretty big and they're pretty sharp. So. I addition the 1620s at addition of five, this, the 32 by 40s at addition of three and the anything larger at addition of three. That's usually my mentality. I don't make smaller than 1620s because screw that. And um, uh, no, I just have this, I have the 17 inch printer here. So I'm gonna use the paper. And, um, and yeah, that's pretty much how it goes. I have a APs also maybe one or two for each of those. So there's a few extra prints lying around but that's pretty much the basis. Thank you. And the next question is, what would you print uh, if I'm looking to print, make my own first uh, photo book? Where would I print it? It depends on how many you want, how many you think you can sell and like all that. So with with photo books, it gets a little bit more interesting. Like uh, how can I, what do I have here? Um, Media's book is right here next to me, actually. This is like the rough copy that's unbound and just like straight from the press for like proofing pur purposes. I actually probably shouldn't show any of this but because um, I haven't showed it to Media yet, but um, it's an unbound. And this is about um, six and 6.8 inches by like nine inches. And a book like this made on a press in Europe, this is an offset book. I won't show you anymore. Uh, offset book, it's about seven by nine inches. Um, we're making 300 copies and I believe that that will cost me around ah, three or four grand, three or four grand. I mean, let's think, think about it this way. If you're making a digital offset book in America or Canada is where I usually make digital offset books, you can make an eight by 10 inch 64 page book at a hundred or 150 copies for right around $12 a copy. You have to make 150 of them. So you know, you're going to spend two grand with shipping and you're going to make, let's say the book costs two grand, which is totally doable for an eight by 10 inch book. And you make 150 copies. If you sell that book for $30, that means that after, um, what, uh, 60 or 70 book sales, you make your money and then 75 book sales is complete profit. Or you sell 20 with a print at a hundred dollars and that's two grand and that pays for the whole project. Or you, you can eventually like sell 10 books at a hundred dollars and that's a thousand and you sell another uh, 20 books or 25 books at $40 and that's another thousand. So in, in 50 book sales, you've made $2,000, you've paid for your book and you have a hundred left to sell for profit. That's with digital offset. It's a little cheaper, a little bit faster. Offset books cost more. You have to pay for shipping. I get these on a, a pallet or two pallets from Europe. So I make more than one at a time to make it cost effective because I have a paper that I love and I use it for every book we make. So that keeps the cost down. They can just run the printer, run the printer, run the printer. They don't have to stop it. So eventually like Nidia's book has 400 copies. Alex Christopher Williams book that we're coming out with, which is gorgeous is gonna have 300, 350 copies. Marshall Shuttle's book that we're coming out with is another banger that has, I think, 350 copies. So in total, that's like a G, that's a that's 11 or 1200 copies of a book coming to me. It's gonna be on one pallet, hopefully. The pallet's gonna cost me $1,400. All the printing is gonna cost me about 10 grand or maybe, well, no, actually, I think it's 13 grand to print the three books plus the two grand for shipping. I pay a designer probably a few grand so all in all, it's going to cost me 15 grand to make three books, divide that all out. And, you know, you have a book cost. That's $30 a copy of a book. So if I can sell them for more than 30, then I make the money back. I mean, I can do the math. Uh, <laughs> if you can do the math, you can sell the books. That's great. Um, can I jump in and add to the question? Of course. Yeah. Um, on the average, how many images do you edit into a book? Um, that depends on the size of the book. If it's a 48 page book, I would say 
that you, we usually want to have between like 24 and 30 images. If it's 64 pages, I would probably put an, a maximum of 40 images, 40 to 42 maybe in the book. If it's larger, depends on the project. I mean, if it's like a retrospective or like a six or seven year project that you've been working on and like I make the, it's kind of weird. I've made these, well, I make these hardcover eight and a half by 10 inch books and I've usually been with people of color in the last few years. I will continue that every year. Those are about 120, 140 pages. And those usually have about 60 to 70 images in them. So those are the hardcover projects. Those cost a little bit more to make. I mean, but I can make a third, I can make an eight by 10 inch hardcover cloth bound book with 400 copies at 120 pages on good paper for about seven grand. All right, thank you. That's great. Well, people are really interested in what you're saying. So I'm happy if you're happy, Chris, to answer any more questions. If people have questions, I'll keep answering questions. Can I just go to the kitchen to get more straight vodka one second? I'll be right back. <laughs> did you say straight vodka? He did. He did. <laughs> Is he kidding or no? <laughs> Maybe not. <laughs> I don't know, but I just feel like I got got a whole bunch of schooling, whole yep. bunch of schooling. Yeah, this is great. Yeah, definitely. Yes, straight vodka. <laughs> Good for you. <laughs> yeah, keep it clean, man. This is like ca like almost calorie free, right? <laughs> I, I wonder if I could ask a quick question. If there's a way you can, uh, there's a if you can reference, reference us to where we might learn more about this blockchain, uh, blockchain with respect to artists. I mean, I understand the, I understand cryptocurrency. Uh, I'd like to learn a little bit more how, like to read a little more how it works in photography. Mm, yeah, so I think that the problem with that is we make our rules. This is a brand new process and we make our own rules here. So what you want it to be is what you get. Well, is when you, as far as the blockchain goes, somebody sort of has it. Like you can mine uh, Bitcoin. Are you mm -hmm. sort of mining something in, in your sense where you're doing the publishing where it comes to you as a server that it goes out? Or is there another server that sort of facilitates the blockchain? Most of the NFTs is what they're called. Like your, your digital mintables are on the Ethereum blockchain for the most part now. I mean, that may change in the future, but they're on Ethereum. So Ethereum, okay. Yeah, Bitcoin is actually more of a um, store of value and not actually a, a um, blockchain. In it is a, I mean, it's it, it, Bitcoin exists on a blockchain, but Ethereum is a blockchain, and I can't even explain that. But um, <laughs> as far as the ether goes, Ethereum works on like a, a, a different type of system where um, you can mint your own collectibles. Meaning, you know, a lot of people are doing this with basketball cards are going digital, uh, Pokemon card, you know, all that stuff from the past that was physical is now digital and people are buying it. So, you know, bas if you look at uh, Hot Shots, the NBA is doing it and they're making a fortune. Everyone is doing this is making a fortune. And- I can put old Mickey you know, Mantle cards on it. Huh? I could put my old Mickey Mantle cards up there. <laughs> yeah, it's a little different. I mean, the how-, how uh, I think that I think you could do whatever you want and you know because you are free to do whatever you want there's nobody telling you anything you know there's no rules here like I said um, that's a, ethereum a t h e r u m e t h e r u m okay ether ethereum um, okay and you can read about ethereum in the blog I mean I did a lecture that's on my website so you can go to the chris graves you can go to any of my websites and find this lecture I did with one of the people, like a guy named Duncan Cockfoster who runs Nifty Gateway, which is one of the bigger NFT sites online. So um, there's some interesting stuff in there. I mean, we get into some real, we have some question and answer. I work, I'm, in, I'm on the board for Blue Sky Gallery in Portland. So it was through the Blue Sky Gallery YouTube page and we got into some crap there. I mean, it was really fun to hear what people have to say about it. And we actually, that conversation is like an hour and a half on YouTube, but we went until like one o'clock in the morning Eastern just talking about this stuff with like 10 or 15 photographers that were really like fighting the fighting. It was good. It was like really cool. So there's a lot to say about it. Um, yeah. But, um, but I don't know. I mean, for me, it was like, I'm going to do what I want here because I was never able to do that before. I always had to follow some kind of system. So to have some freedom finally was like, please. That's great. Well, one of the things I'm learning from you that I always knew is as a photographer, you really have to be very entrepreneurial. 
it's a business. I mean, you can just be a photographer, but I don't think that that's even the photographers that have agents that get them jobs all the time are still looking for work and finding opportunities for themselves. You know, I know, I know friends that are making hundreds of thousands of dollars a year with other people supporting them, like getting them those jobs, but still go out and find the new opportunities because, you know, you never know you have to work. Um, for me, I'm a little bit, I'm way more lazy than that. I do not want to have like jobs all the time. And I love being able to maybe, um, like for, I'm, I can't complain. My jobs are very lucrative when I get them. And therefore, you know, I'm photographing like, yeah, I don't know if I can actually talk about stuff like that, but let's say I'm photographing for a gallery and, um, and I have to photograph 30 Kandinsky's in a day, right? I can say to the gallery, uh, and you know, think about this, 30 Kandinsky's in a day, I bring two lights, two umbrellas, I photograph the Kandinsky's, I do angles shots and make sure there's no glare, all that. And you have to give me seven, at least $75 per shot, times 30, plus a location fee of $100 an hour for eight hours a day. So I can come home with three grand or four grand in a day, photographing things that don't move. <laughs> so that, if I can do that twice or three times a month, I don't really have to work very hard to like kind of figure out my life and I can figure out how to like play around with NFTs or go shoot some stuff somewhere. You know, like it's really, and sometimes in New York, me doing that is every day. I'll do that five days a week. And, and you know, it won't make that money is like, that's, that's not rare, but you know, you know, that's, that's a lot of money. I really, I mean, no, that's good. I appreciate it. Usually it's more like I make a G a day to leave my house. And that's kind of like where I, that's a kind of a standard. If I'm working eight hours, I need to get paid at least a thousand dollars. So what, why are we talking about this? Did I bring this up? I'm sorry. No, I but brought it up. <laughs> he's talking about entrepreneurship, but we should, oh, somebody just is coming in. Um, so Reed, are you at Purchase College? What is this background here? You're muted. Sorry. Um, no, <laughs> I am not at Purchase College. I'm in Philadelphia. Gotcha. This is um, a, uh, a structure called The Shambles. It's in downtown Philadelphia. And it um, is an old marketplace. Uh, I was very lucky to get this shot. This is a day for night shot. Um, I took it during the day. I'm sorry. No, the architect. It's it looks like my school. I was I was getting a nostalgic. There you go. Um, yeah. It's about a block long, and it's uh, uh, on either side is uh, Second Street. If you know Philadelphia, mm -hmm. Stone oh. Street. It's old, you know, old Philly. And uh, there are restaurants and bars and so forth lining the streets. And this is usually full of people. They hold events there, markets. Sometimes there's a, uh, you know, a uh, farmer's market in, in good weather. Back in the before times, there were all these things going on. And I came before by- Before times, like one year ago. I know, I know. And uh, it was, I was very lucky because usually it's got something going on in it. And this year it was empty. So I, I had, it was the end of the day. I hadn't had a very good day of shooting. And I said, oh my God, it looked empty. Click, click, click. Yeah, and perfect. then I decided to make it day for night. Perfect. Oh, also I wanted to mention with the money that, we, that I make, it doesn't happen often. And people usually charge way more than I charge for these things. So think about that. Like I don't charge, I am cheap in comparison to other photographers that do what I do. Just so you know where I stand here. Because? Because what, what do you mean? Because- Well, if you could get, I don't know, easily 25% more than you're getting now or more. Yeah. Why do you not ask for that? Because well, I don't, I want the job. Oh, so it would cut down on the number of jobs if you did. I that. don't know, but I'm not going to find out. Ah, okay. Good enough. Yeah, I, I understand that. <laughs> it's enough. For me, it's like, I can't physically ask you for more money than I'm asking you for already. Like sometimes it's like I do a job and I'm like, whoa, I did it. I don't have to do any homework and you owe me four grand in that day. And it's like, that is amazing to me. I mean, I just, I can't ask you for more than that. Mm -hmm. Even yeah. if you're rich. <laughs> yeah. But anyhow. Well, this was great. I mean, we went a little bit over. Um, yeah. You were so generous. Thank you, Chris. Um, uh, Again, Nidia is going to be here next week. Please come back. Um, and uh, and I just am really thankful for all you shared tonight. It was great. Congratulations on the work that you're doing. Good luck with your books. Um, Thank you I really so much. love seeing the new work. Um, and 
and seeing the the breadth of your of your of your journey uh, for National Geographic. That was excellent. Yeah, yeah thank thanks, you for, for thanks for listening to all that. I mean, I, I appreciate it, and uh, thanks for having me. It was um, fun. I get you know talking crap 